and we've got to do everything for Him because He saw every flaw that you have. He saw every sin that you've ever committed, thought about, will do, all of that, and says to you, I love you anyway. And I, and I died for you. And I want you to live with me forever. How can we not give Him our best? I can sing because I know I'm loved by God. Amen. How many of you know you're loved by God? Some of you just don't know that, huh? <laughs> and those of you that do, you need to notify your faces this morning. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a great day to be in the Lord and to be together with His family. Max Lucado has written a bunch of books. I started to say several. He's written more than a several. He's written a lot of books. One of them called The Eye of the Storm. He told the short story of Chicago White Sox player Steve Lyons. On July the 16th in 1990, during a game against the Detroit Tigers, he laid down a bunt. And as was uh, his, the way he played, he took off for first base as hard as he could. And it was obvious that it was going to be close, so he dove into first base headlong. He dove into first base. He hurled himself on the ground. Uh, his mouth and his eyes and his ears were full of dirt. But the umpire called safe. And as he lay there on the ground, he heard the pitcher for the Detroit Tigers begin to argue with the umpire. And they're nose to nose screaming at one another. And Steve Lyons jumped up and he's going to put his two cents worth in. So you got three of them standing there arguing about this close call at first base. He got so excited and so into the argument that he forgot where he was. He felt dirt trickling down in his pants. He just took them, uh, uh, took them off, put them down, and started brushing away the dirt in front of 20,000 fans. <clears throat> now, Lucado goes on to say, Normally I'm not for someone dropping their pants in public. But I admire anyone who dives into first base. I think he deserves a salute. And the reason is, of course, that so many people won't do that and don't do that. In the baseball game of life, too many people saunter to first base. They're ho-humming through life. They're yawning through life. They're looking all around and accepting the mediocre. They're not overwhelmed. They're not even underwhelmed. They're just not whelmed at all. Uh, and it, they're not overwhelmed about life. And so we admire the one who can dive headlong into first base. There's too much mediocrity in life today. Would you agree with that? There are too many people just ho-humming through life. Too many who are yawning rather than cheering. There are more people who are not excited and just can't get their enthusiasm worked up than there are uh, uh, for those who do get excited. There are more people who are just ambling through life rather than diving headlong into first base. There are too many people who are lazy and lackluster, whether we're talking about baseball or we're talking about living, talking about our jobs, talking about what goes on in life. What grabs your enthusiasm? What gets a hold of you? What grips you too often? I think it's too little. And so we admire the guy who dives into first base headlong. He gets skinned up in the process. He drops his pants in front of 20,000 people. He forgets they're there. You've got to admire a guy who thinks that much of the game of baseball. Too many are leisurely strolling through life. There are too many half-hearted employees. Think about the people that you work around. Ah, but more than that, Think about what the person they are working around. And is your enthusiasm showing? Have you ever been there when a great worker or a great student has been told, you know, you need to slow it down a little bit. You're making the rest of us look bad. You ever heard that? I have. And what really ought to be going on is that person needs to be the one that is the example that everybody else is looking to and trying to rise to that person's level. It's a sad state of affairs because that should motivate people to do more. And it shows up in marriages that lack luster. 
It shows up in parents who are not giving their all to raising their children. And I'm sorry to say too often it shows up in churches. Like the people that Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. He said, To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. There are many people like that in the world. And again, we see it in the church. I can be up here sometimes talking about uh, Jesus and what he's done for us, what he means to us, and getting all into it and notice somebody going, I saw he had a lot of yellow tabs this morning. I wonder what time he's going to quit. I wonder when we're going to be able to get gone to lunch. Oh, me. Jesus. You know, it just shouldn't be. That's a sad state of affairs. And uh, there are, it's a wonderful thing to see Christians diving headlong into first base, going for it with everything they have. Where are the Steve Lyons in this world? The late Tom Landry told the Dallas Cowboys team one time, it is my job as a coach to make you do what you do not want to do so that you will become what you have always wanted to become. I love that. I see that as my job. It's my job to make you do what you don't want to do so that you can become what you've always wanted to become. Amen? Amen. We, uh, uh, he made less than his players but he made them give everything they had. Bill Hybels, the pastor of Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, at one time was the, uh, uh, the chaplain for the Chicago Bears. And he was struggling with how much of a challenge to give them. So he talked to Mike Singletary, who told him, you're speaking to guys who have just been told by Mike Ditka that you've got to sacrifice your body. You've got to break body parts. You've got to bleed for the team. And then if you stand up here and say, well, now, if you have a little extra time, maybe you could get into Bible study. If you have some extra money, maybe you could give it to the church. He said, you need to step it up. You need to crank it up. The challenge has got to be great for these men to even think about uh, uh, Christ. It's got to be a great challenge. When a, when a football player or a baseball player makes MVP, when they get their trophies, who do they have to thank for it? Their coach. He's the one that brought them to that point so that they, they are diving headlong into first base and giving it everything that they have. You know, I love sports illustrations. We talk about no pain, no gain, and those are the things that, tr that motivate me and I hope will motivate all of us because it, they, these things are true. And so when I come here on Sunday morning, folks, I want you to know I can't wait for Sundays. This evening, I'll be, I'll be thinking to myself, man, next Sunday I get to preach again. I mean, I love this. I love doing what I'm doing. I love being able to, to preach to you and to share with you and hopefully to motivate you to dive headlong into first base. When I preach on Sunday morning, I want you to know you're getting all I got. You're getting every bit of me. And it's getting harder these days. You know, after you turn 72, something happens. I don't know, something clicks off. But, uh, but you're still going to get all I got. I knew a preacher one time, a friend of mine, who used to bring a, a chair, bring a stool up on stage. And he preached from that stool. And I used to think, come on, man, where's your energy? What's going on? You're not excited at all about what you're preaching, that you've got to sit down and read a sermon to the people? I mean, that's, that's not hurling yourself headlong into first base, is it? And, and so the day that I bring a stool up here and sit in it, you're going to know it's because that's all I got. That's, that's all I can do, you know, because you're always going to get all that I have. Somebody told me one time, I bet you're worn out after you preach on Sundays. Yeah, yeah I am. I'm on Sunday evenings, I am really beat. I'm really tired. And this person offered me some advice. Said, you know, I know how you can beat that. You need to just stand lightly at the podium and just lightly 
touch it. Stay on the balls of your feet. Don't move around. Don't get all excited. And you won't be so tired on Sunday nights. Listen, tired is what I'm looking for on Sunday nights. This is, what, this is the way that it ought to be. Because I'm going to, as they say in sports, I'm going to leave it all on the field. This field, every bit I got. Uh, I buy into Stephen, uh, Steve Lyons' philosophy. Hurl yourself into it. Hurt yourself. Just do it. All of these things. And so... What does that have to do with church on Sunday? What does that have to do with the Bible? Well, the Bible is a book on diving headlong into first base. First base. I sometimes wonder what people think the Bible is all about. Because there are some churches, and I've been there, quite honestly, where there's no emotion whatsoever. No excitement. We just go through the motions, get the job done, and go home. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something, folks. In my opinion, that's worthless. That's just absolutely useless. And so, a faith that has no emotion, but it does have truth, is still worthless. A faith that is all emotion. Now, we could come in here and, and we could be jumping and shouting and rolling in the aisles and speaking in tongues and doing all of that stuff and getting all excited and all emotional without the truth. And it's useless. It's worthless. So there's got to be a balance. We've got we've to be able to, I'm, I'm always telling the singers, trying to remind them, smile, smile, smile. Show what you're singing. Do you really believe 10,000 reasons? How can you sing that without a smile on your face? For 10,000 reasons, I rise up every day and worship my God and praise my God. And no matter what goes on, you get those words to that song. No matter what happens during the day, at the end of the day, may I still be praising your name. Amen. That's what it's all about. And so, uh, it's, uh, being a Christian should make us excited. And we should be diving headlong into first base. You take Abraham, for example. Abraham was told by God, I'm going to give you a son very late in life. And through this son, through this one son, I'm going to bless the entire world. I'm going to bless all the nations, not just your nation. I'm going to bless all the nations. And then he tells him these words in Genesis 22, 2, after the boy is grown, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, do you get this? This is his one and only son that God has told him, through him, I'm going to bless the nations of the world. Now, I want you to take him up on the mountain and kill him. And so, what does the Bible say about that? The very next verse, it says, early the next morning. Now, did God tell Abraham when? No. He didn't say, I want you to get up early in the morning and go do this. He just said, this is what I want you to do. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and hurled himself headlong into first base. In other words, he was in, excited and enthusiastic about obeying God, no matter what the command was. And we know for, from reading the Bible, of course, God stopped him. But before he went up on the mountain, the Bible says he knew that God would raise him from the dead. And the Bible says figuratively, he did raise him from the dead because he stayed Abraham's arm. He would not allow Abraham to kill that boy. He was testing him. He was, and Abraham not only passed the test, he passed it enthusiastically early the next morning. Let's go, boy. We've got to go up on the mountain and we'll kill you. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it, it's, just, it's amazing what God's people have done throughout the years. And the point is that that is hurling yourself into first base. 2 Kings 10, 16, a man by the name of Yehu said, Come along with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then he had him ride along in his chariot. Now he was going into battle. Come on with me. Get up here in this chariot. And I want you to watch my zeal for the Lord. I want you to see what I'm doing. There's going to be blood on the field today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give it everything that I've got. I love it when Babe Ruth used to do that. Of course, that was before my time. But I've seen, I've seen film of it 
when he steps up to the plate, I can't even imagine it, points to uh, right field and hammers a home run on the next pitch out there. I mean, it's amazing the excitement and the zeal and what it will do for someone when they are hurling themselves headlong into first base. Second Chronicles 19.11, act with courage and may the Lord be with those who do well. Act with courage, be fearless, and the Lord is going to be with you, and you are going to do well. Ezra 10, verse 4, rise up, this matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. I think about the people who were, showed up here to help hand out food uh, on that Saturday. Rise up and do it. Have courage, and we're going to get the job done. I think about the VBS workers who were here those three nights who worked so hard for the blessings of a few children. Rise up and take courage, and the Lord will be with you. David said in Psalm 69, 9, Zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for your house, for the house of God. David says, I am consumed with excitement. Uh, and he said in other places, come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. I mean, he is ready to go. I think about years ago, back when we did bus ministry. I remember there was one house that we pulled up to one, sun, uh, one Sunday morning. And we, uh, at this particular house, it was a five-year-old who rode the bus with us. And that five-year-old's parents never would get up early enough to get him ready to go on the bus. Very often, we would go into his house and get him dressed, and then take him on his bus while his parents slept. But one Sunday morning, we pulled up in front of his house, and the door flung open, and he was wearing his mama's nightgown, and came running to the bus. Zeal for the house of the Lord had consumed him, and he was ready to go. That's the kind of excitement. I, wanted, I don't want to see you coming to nightgowns, but I want to see you coming excited and ready to serve the Lord in whatever we do. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah says, But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And that's where I am. It's where I have been since the day that I was baptized into Christ. I knew that night God was calling me to something. I cannot hold it in. I must speak. And I've said an awful lot of dumb things over the years, especially in those early years when I didn't know enough to be talking about what I was t talking about. It was just crazy. But I would, I would talk to anybody, still will, anybody who will listen. If you want to hear about the Lord, I'll share it with you. I will, uh, I will say whatever I need to say. I will go wherever I need to go. I'll talk to, I've been in jails, hospitals, you name it. I think I've been there. Nursing homes, share the word of the Lord and the zeal for the house of God must consume us as a church uh, if, we want, if we want to accomplish the mission that God has given us. I look at that and I say to a young man who says, I want to be a preacher, as long as you can keep from preaching, don't preach. Do you get what I mean by that? If you can hold it in, if you can hold it in, then it's not from God. It's just you. But if you can't help it, if you're like Jeremiah, I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I must preach the Word of God. I must let it out. Uh, and, as, and that's what makes good parents, not just preachers. That's what makes good parents. That's what makes good husbands and good wives. That's what makes good companies. That's what makes good projects. And it certainly is what makes good churches. When the uh, zeal for the house of the Lord overwhelms us. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. We're not just talking about church. We're not just talking about uh, Christianity here. We're talking about whatever your hand finds to do. Do it with everything you've got. Every bit of you. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart 
as working for the Lord and not for men. A great story in the book of Acts about a man named Philip. Philip was one of the original deacons. And Philip, uh, after he was appointed a deacon, went and started preaching the Word of God in Samaria. He was winning souls to the Lord. And in the midst of this great ministry that he was working, God called him and said, I got one guy I need you to talk to. And I want you to go down on the road to Gaza and I want you to meet up with him. He'll be in a chariot and I'll be with you, Philip. So what does Philip do? He goes down to that road. He sees that chariot. You know the story? He ran to the chariot. He didn't just, you know, I get a lift. He ran to the chariot and he, and he heard what the man was reading in the Word of God. So he was enthusiastic. He was sliding headlong into first base. Paul said, never be lacking in your zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Keep stoking the furnace. Keep the pedal to the metal. Run the boiler until it explodes. Go for it all. When I, when I first moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma from Dallas, and I was bus minister uh, for Garnett Church of Christ. Garnett Church of Christ had the biggest bus ministry in the country of, among churches of Christ. Okay? So we're doing workshops. We're trying to help other people learn and, and teaching. And so the first year I was there, I was fortunate to be able to get to speak to a pretty large crowd about bus ministry. And, and I took questions. And somebody in, the, somebody in the audience asked me, what do you do about burnout? I said, burnout? Burnout's not biblical. I, what do I do about burnout? I just don't burn out. And you shouldn't either. We don't burn out for the Lord. We just keep on going. Keep stoking the furnace. Keep working. Never be lacking in zeal. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. And that's what the men of the Bible did. They gave their best. They hurled themselves headlong into first base. The early Christians in Acts chapter 2. The early Christians, there were 3,000 of them. They grew rapidly to 5,000. And only two chapters later, Peter and a bunch of the others are in jail. And they're being told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Now listen to what they said in Acts 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't keep from it. We must, we saw it. We saw Jesus alive. We saw him on the cross and then we saw him in the tomb and then we saw him alive again. How can we not preach it? How can we, North Lakes, not preach it? We must preach it to our friends and to our neighbors and to everyone around us. That is what makes God's church great. It's what made America great in the beginning when America was established on Christian principles uh, and the freedoms that we now have come from that, from the excitement and the enthusiasm of those men and women who established our country. Uh, and most of us take that for granted today. But that is the same spirit that will cause any church to grow, that will cause any church to begin to win lost souls. Folks, I want to say to you, we must grow, not for growth's sake, but we must grow because people need saving. People are dying unsaved all around us. And oh, it's time to go to church. We've got to, we, I mean, how can, do you want to invite somebody to a church that is ho-humming through life? No. And so the excitement that gets in, sometimes... Uh, I, I want to say to you that I believe that our worship teams do the absolute best they can. They are worshiping God. They are leading us in that worship. I don't always hit a home run. Don't say amen. Okay. But I, <laughs> sometimes I blow it. Sometimes I get in the car outside and Barbara and I are on the way home and I want to cry. Because I just didn't get it across today. And I'm just upset with myself. And I know that anybody who's leading worship sometimes feel the same way. I just didn't get it done today. But you know what? You'll never be able to say that they nor I did not leave it all on the field. We're going to give it our best. 
Uh, I, I started a diet this week, and I've been having some trouble with getting my blood sugar regulated. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been through that, but when your blood sugar gets really low, you, you get weak, you get trembly, you get terrible feelings in your stomach. In my case, I can't think straight. I can't think crooked. I just can't think. Okay? And, and it's, it's really tough. Just before church started, I felt it come on. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sitting down there and I'm, I'm kind of shaky and I'm thinking, what's going to happen? Lord, you've got to take care of this because I, I, I don't have any candy. I don't, I don't have any sugar. I, don't have any, I can't get it back up. And so it's up. I'm good, you know, because God will do that. And when you start laying it out, everything that you have, God is going to, God is going to take care of you. God is going to make the right things happen. Uh, I want people to say, I want people to say about North Lakes, how can I get in on that? These people are excited. These people are having fun. These people are worshiping God. And, and yet, they're not oh so religious. They're having fun with it. They are loving God. I want people to say that about us and say, how can I get in on that? Amen. How can I be a part of that? And of course, the answer to that is you come to Jesus and you believe in Him. And you, and you put your life in His hands. And you confess His name. And you're buried in baptism. And rise to walk in a new life. And that new life is exciting. It's not ho-hum. It's exciting. I thought it was ho-hum when I first became a Christian. I thought, ah, it's, you know, that's all right. I'll just sacrifice the rest of my life. Oh, what a dummy. You know, because it is the most exciting life you can have. And I want people to be, to be wanting to be in on that. Uh, passion is a good word to use. To have passion for life. To have passion for your church. To have passion for Christ. How do you spell passion? Pass I on. Pass I on. That's passion. Don't ever forget it. We've got to, get, we've got to show our passion by passing it on and holding nothing back. Be a Steve Lyons for our church and, and give, a, give us a chance for victory. It's the main reason that we love to watch sports, right? We see them out there giving all they got. And we just love it when something like Steve Lyons happens. And, and we're cheering. You know, I don't know about you, but I often cheer at my television set when I, when I see something great happening. I just love Brett Favre. Now, I know most of his career he was a traitor, but, uh, but I love the guy. He completes a pass in the end zone, and it's maybe not even a real important game. And what do you see Brett Favre doing? Running down the field, jumping up and high-fiving all. I mean, he is laying it out there, right? And, and we cheer that. We say that's great. But church is no place for that. Church ought to be exactly where that's happening. It ought to be a time where we are high-fiving one another. We're running around this building looking for somebody that we don't know yet and getting other people in here so that we can do that again next week and find new people all the time. Uh, have you ever, you, you watch the Olympics, they're on right now, right? Uh, Special Olympics, several years ago, the diving, get this, the diving competition was won by a girl in a wheelchair. Diving. I mean, it's that, that kind of, that's what I'm asking of you today, to get that kind of enthusiasm, to get that kind uh, of excitement within you. And no matter what anybody else in this room does with this, I'm going to hurl myself headlong into first base. And I want you to, want you to do that as well. Yes. So, uh, I read about a man who worked for a construction company that was well known and well known for their great jobs, their great buildings. Uh, and one day, this, he's a manager on, on, in this construction company, and one day the owner, his boss, came to him, very wealthy man, very rich, and told him, I'm going to take a tour of the world and I'll be gone for a couple of months. During that period of time, I want you to build me a house. And he had, the, had it all laid out and architecture and all that. And so he did. Uh, the man left and this manager saw a chance to make some money. 
So he cut back on everything. He built this house when it called for two by sixes, he used two by fours. He didn't use as much paint as he should have. Lots of different places that he could cut back, and he did so. Now, it looked great, but it was shoddy work, and he knew it. When his boss got back, he said to him, I have a surprise for you. The reason that I wanted you to build that house is that you've been such a good manager for me. I want to give you the house and handed him the keys to the shoddy piece of work that he had done. You know, it goes back to Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Uh, you know, and the key is, then how do you feel about the Lord? Not how do you feel about me. How do you feel about the Lord? What do you think of the Lord? And we've got to do everything for Him because He saw every flaw that you have. He saw every sin that you've ever committed, thought about, will do, all of that, and says to you, I love you anyway. And I, and I died for you. And I want you to live with me forever. How can we not give him our best? Uh, we need to be a Steve Lyons. Whatever your first base is, hurl yourself into it with all that you have. I want to read to you uh, a passage from, that, from, from uh, Lucato's book as we close this. Uh, in speaking, uh, of course, he's talking about Steve Lyons, and he says, As you can imagine, the jokes began. Women behind the uh, White Sox dugout waved dollar bills when he came onto the field. No one, wrote one columnist, had ever dropped his drawers on the field. Not Wally Moon, not Blue Moon Odom, not even Heine Manish. Within 24 hours of the exposure, he received more exposure than he had ever gotten in his entire career. Seven live television and approximately 20 radio interviews. We've got this pitcher, Melito Perez, who earlier this month pitched a no-hitter, Lyon stated. And I'll guarantee you he didn't do two live television shots afterwards. I pull my pants down and I do seven. Something's pretty skewed toward the zany in this game. Fortunately for Steve, he was wearing sliding pants under his baseball pants. <laughs> Otherwise, the game would have been rated R instead of PG-13. Lucado continues, Now, I don't know Steve Lyons. I'm not a White Sox fan, nor am I normally appreciative of, a man, of men who drop their pants in public. But I think Steve Lyons deserves a salute. I think anyone who dives into first base deserves a salute. How many guys do you see roaring down the baseline of life more concerned about getting a job done than they are about saving their necks? How often do you see people diving headfirst into anything? Too seldom, right? But when we do, when we see a gutsy human throwing caution to the wind and taking a few risks, now that's a person worthy of a pat on the back. <laughs> So here's to all the Steve Lyons of the world. Here's to the Miracles, a choral group out of Memphis, Tennessee, made up of the mentally retarded and the stout-hearted. Just see if you can listen to them and still feel sorry for yourself. Here's to the hero of the San Francisco Marathon who crossed the finish line without seeing it. He was blind. Here's to the woman whose husband left her with a nest of kids to raise and bills to pay but who somehow tells me every Sunday that God has never been closer. Here's, <clears throat> here's to the single father of two girls who, lear <clears throat> who learned to braid their hair. Here's to the grandparents who came out of retirement to raise the children their children couldn't raise. Here's to the foster parents who took in a child long enough for that child to take their hearts and then gave the child up again. Here's to the girl told by everyone to abort the baby who chose to keep the baby. Here's to the doctor who treats more than half of his patients for free. Here's to the heroin addict turned missionary. Here's to the executive who every Tuesday hosts a 5.30 a.m. meeting for Bible study and prayer. Here's to all of you reckless lovers of life and God 
who stand on first base because you paid a price to get there. So what if you forget about pleasing the crowd and get caught with your pants down? At least you're playing ball in the pros. Most of us aren't even in your league. Would you stand with me, please? And let's pray together. Oh, Father. It's a fun thing to say we need to slide headlong into first base, but, you know, we just need to give it all up for you. We need to pursue our relationship with you with everything that we have. We need to pursue our relationships with each other, with our our spouses and with uh, our friends, with everything that we have. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be that exciting church where people want to come in and hear about Jesus. We love him, we love you, and we pray in his name. Amen.